Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are around the world. Thank you very much for joining us today to this uh, Mano Medical, part of Genia Group uh, webinar, presented today, as always, by, with, uh, by Dr. Regal. Hi, Ron, can you hear me? How are you there? I hear you well. I hear you very well, sir. Perfect, perfect. All right. Thank you again uh, for being here with us today for this last webinar of 2022. Uh, in total, we reached number seven. So uh, if you didn't have the chance to see the previous ones, all of them are in replay on Mano Medical YouTube channel. So I'm giving this small introduction why we have people coming in, coming in, you know. You are a lot that have registered uh, for today's webinar. Some of you won't be able to attend today, but don't worry, you'll have access to the replay. We will send you the link uh, probably next week. Okay, so I'm, this is how it's going to work uh, today. I'm going to introduce quickly the company. And then uh, I will introduce Ron. Ron will do the presentation. And please stay with us because at the end, after maybe 45 minutes, our presentation will have uh, 10 or 15 minutes of questions and answer. All right. So take uh, um, your on, on your uh, on your page, you will see the chat room and you can send your questions right now uh, during the intervention and I will keep them and ask them at the end. OK, so now I'm going to share my screen. Ron, can you tell me if you see? I, uh, yeah. I see your screen. Oh. Perfect. All right. So Mano Medical uh, has been specialist in uh, equipment in the veterinary field for more than 20 years. We are more than 20 in the company now. We are from France, but we are part of the Genia Group now. Genia is also a French company that is internationally renowned uh, manufacturer for veterinary supplies. You can see at the bottom of your page all the range of products that Genia can provide you all around the world through their distribution channel. So injection, surgery, capture, protection, cleaning, etc. Uh, the company was founded in 1944, uh, 1945, sorry, uh, we are uh, based in the west part of France, but we have branches in the US, in Hong Kong, in Australia also, and our goal is to provide uh, to the veterinarians uh, quality products uh, for them to have a better practice and improve the comfort and hygiene of the animal. Okay, so this is the repartition of the Genia Group today. Uh, so we have uh, three or four employees in the US. Uh, most of us are in France, but we have production, promotion and distribution also in China. And we have also a subsidiary in Australia. So this is the list of the previous webinar that we have done so far uh, this year and last year. And uh, the last one today, as you know, because you have registered, is about the benefits of laser therapy in canine rehabilitation. All right. So, Dr. Regal is the co-founder of the American Institute of Medical Laser Applications. In 2009, he provides education uh, in both veterinary medicine and other healthcare professions. He has written uh, papers, many, many papers and book regarding uh, equine anatomy or equine and companion animal therapy. Uh, for example, he was the co-editor of the textbook Laser Therapy in Veterinary Medicine Photobiomodulation. That's a book that we used to uh, provide also to uh, some of our customers and that is still available on the market and that I really recommend to you. Okay, so as I told you, we will do the questions at the end of uh, Dr. Regal's presentation. You can also write my email down uh, if you are from Spain, from the US, and you don't know uh, who to uh, talk to, if you are interested in the education or maybe in equipment, ask me your questions and I will direct you to your distributors in your countries. Okay, so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to give Dr. Regal the possibility of sharing his screen and start his presentation. All right, and uh, you can start sharing and I will tell you, Ron, if uh, we can see your screen. Should be able to right now. Yes. Okay, let me see. 
No, I don't see your screen now. Oh, should be right now. It was, uh, took a second there, but it should be now. Yes? No? No, I don't. Uh, maybe I didn't. I, uh, I, I put you as a presenter and maybe I have to put you as an organizer. Can, can you share your screen? Yeah, exactly. See it now? All right. Thank you very much. Now I let you do it and I'm going to turn off my camera and my microphone. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. See you after. All right. I will be there. I will be here. Welcome everybody. Uh, uh, again, welcome colleagues, veterinary technicians. I'm trying to close this window for the webinar here. Uh, technicians, uh, nurses, practice managers, and all those interested in laser therapy. Uh, today, I've, I'm excited to present to you the benefits of laser therapy and canine rehabilitation. That's a very, very broad subject, so I'm going to try to hit all the high points here today. And, uh, you know, again, as uh, Remy told you, please, uh, you can put your questions in right away. If we get to them at the end, we will. If not, you know, I'm going to have my email and you'll be able to see that. I have a few disclosures to start off with. As he said, I am the co-founder of the American Institute of Medical Laser Application, and we basically provide training since 2007, uh, training and certification for various laser manufacturers and healthcare professionals. That is the textbook. It was actually voted, and I'm not sure where the votes came from, I think just the United States as one of the top 50 textbooks in the history of veterinary medicine. So I was kind of very proud of that honor. And again, I've published numerous papers and I've been fortunate enough and blessed to be able to lecture all around the world. And when you do that, you learn a lot from every, all your colleagues internationally. I mean, it's just an unbelievable opportunity. I'm a fellow in the American Society of Lasers and Medicine and Surgery. I'm a photobiomodulation board member in the Optics Society. And I'm a member of several veterinary medical and advisory boards. And believe me, none of those affiliations have anything to do with the information that I'm about to present to you because what I'm about to present to you is is you know fairly academic here and non-denominational again thank you Madam Medical for this opportunity I, it's something that I'm very passionate about and I love sharing my information here so to tell you why I'm so passionate about it I'll give you a little bit of my personal history I own my own practice for a little over 25 years and uh, actually had four other veterinarians working for me and eight other office and, and techni technical employees. I bought my first laser therapy laser in 1979. So, you know, that was, that was a very new idea back in the, in the late seventies, early eighties. And I had a colleague that kind of took me under his wing and suggested that, you know, he was going to go to China and he was going to bring back a laser. And if I wanted one, I did. So I did. And that's what started it all. So again, as I evolved through this, I went to different powers of laser, different prototypes of laser, and I've not worked with all the lasers on the market, but I've worked with, you know, the majority of them. And I have worked with the one that Nanomedical makes, and it is a very good laser, very versatile in practice. And uh, again, I uh, have had an opportunity to evaluate that and go from there. So today, I'm going to go over some definition of rehabilitation and performance maintenance, which is kind of not in the title there, but that's part of rehabilitation or maintaining their athletic performance or maintaining the performance or quality of life when you get to a geriatric even. And then I'm going to, you know, the benefits of laser therapy to rehabilitation and performance maintenance, how to measure some of the, some of the parameters we use to measure the patient's pro progress. Rehabilitation of painful conditions, geriatric, degenerative, and traumatic. In other words, I'm going to keep the science today. I'm going to have my references up here, and I will make mention of some of them, but I'm going to basically, the entire talk here is going to be case-based because I picked cases out of the hundreds of cases that I have that I think will give everybody here a good idea and maybe open up their, their horizon a little bit on how they can do it, uh, how they can put it into their practice here. I even have one or two equine cases at the end there that if I have time, we'll do. And if I don't, I will probably skip those. And then uh, the last but not least, which is an important part, is integrating the laser therapy into the regenerative medicine. Because part of rehabilitation is regenerative, with PRP and stem cells becoming part of the mainstream of practice. So define canine rehabilitation. I mean, we have adapted basically the physical therapy techniques and to that is on the human side, and we want to restore and increase the function and mobility of our patients, you know, bring them back to previous function before an injury or maintain that function that they have. 
And again, we want to restore function by reducing pain, accelerating the recovery from injury or surgery, and slow down the degenerative diseases and age-related diseases and improve their quality of life. And again, you can use this discipline. It can be applied to, you know, not only the canine and feline species, but also the equine. And I've actually seen some uh, rabbits go through rehabilitation. Now, they don't go in the underwater treadmill, but they do do some other things. And a lot of avian patients that have had to be rehabbed from injuries that they've uh, received uh, either in the wild or actually uh, ones that are domesticated here. So canine performance maintenance, when we talk about that, we're talking about reduction of pain, reducing inflammation, improvement of strength and improvement of function. In other words, if they can recover faster from their event, you know, they're going to perform better. They're gonna prevent injuries because if we can take the inflammation and pain away, they're not gonna have those repetitive stress injuries. And bottom line is our athletes have a higher quality of life. It's unique for each patient and client and dependent upon the case, the severity, what your goals are, and of course the client's compliance to what you're doing. Just to give you an example here, I mean, surgical recovery, trauma. I mean, we use a lot of different modalities. We use a lot of different techniques, passive range of motion exercises, massage, you know, warm, moist heat, ice, of course, is, is a traditional, uh, one of the physical therapy stand, you know, foundations. And of course, you know, laser therapy, photobiomodulation therapy is probably the most versatile and important part of all these different aspects of physical therapy. So I used surgical recovery and trauma, but let's hop out an orthopedic condition. I mean, basically if somebody, you know, a patient suffering from osteoarthritis, a patient suffering from degenerative joint disease. Uh, I have a case in here of degenerative myopathy, again, Photobiomodulation therapy, laser therapy is an important part of your protocol to recover these patients. And then we have, again, neurological conditions. Again, I just mentioned degenerative myopathy. You know, we're not exactly sure how that works yet, but I've got a few others in here that I'm going to use as case examples. But I just put three examples up there. There's probably six or eight that come immediately to mind. But I just wanted to give you an idea that, again, it is really unique to each patient and each patient's desires. So, again, what does laser therapy actually provide us? I mean, it relieves pain. I mean, it's been proven over and over and over in the literature. You get a modulation of the inflammatory response. In other words, we still have all four phases of inflammation, but they're a lot shorter. And we get an increase in the microcirculation and therefore an accelerating of the healing process. And that's what rehabilitation is all about is getting them back to form and function as fast as possible. Just briefly, I'm gonna go through the physiological effects of laser therapy here. And again, pain is an adverse sensory experience, you know, from trauma or from, you know, some kind of repetitive stress or whatever. And uh, it, it basically results in an avoidance or modifies their behavior. And when you alleviate pain, it's not only our professional obligation to do so, but it also is a key contributor to the successful rehab outcomes and performance because it's proved when when uh, a patient is not in pain they recover a lot faster so right off the bat how does photobiomodulation therapy laser therapy reduce pain and i'm not going to go through all these but i just wanted to give you an idea here that it is a biochemical cascade of events you know it has a lot to do with nitric oxide production you get a release of beta endorphins a serotonin release we all like our serotonins and again there's a whole bunch of events that occur biochemically and simultaneously that causes a state of analgesia. And just to give you a little bit of an overview of the pain pathway here, again, I put in different parameters here of what happens when you and put a high dose there and basically follow that nerve pathway. For example, if I have a injury on the distal limb, I wanna start in the cervical area at the, you know, basically whatever dermatome that follows, C3, 4, 5, 6, whatever, and try to laser that area and then follow the nerve pathways down the, down the forelimb, down to the area that you're trying to treat. Same thing goes for your hips, your stifles, all those things. Start with the nerve system first. 
and again, it's been proven in the literature that you know we pretty I have to give a high dose there to block that transmission. And on that last slide, you saw the pathway to pain. So I'm basically starting at the uh, the, almost the, you know, it's still the peripheral nervous system, but I'm starting, you know, right next to the spinal cord and working my way down there. So modulation of the inflammatory reaction, again, we all know what inflammation is, and it shortens each of the four stages of the inflammatory reaction. And you have another biochemical cascade of events. I mean, all these things happen. Vasodilation, you get interleukin-1 decrease in the area. You get an, you know, a lymphocyte response and reactive oxygen species production, cytochrome, temperature modulation, but all these things, again, without going into all the science here and everything, and if anybody has a question of that, I'd be more than happy to expand on that personally to them. But again, what happens is, is we're basically causing a biochemical cascade of events that results in that reduction of each one of those phases of inflammation. And again, this has been in the literature for a long time here. And here's some of the references, and I know that my slide set will be available to you as uh, from Mental Medical. And if you want to look up these references, I'm not going to go into them all because, uh, again, I, this has been in the literature for a long time. Uh, in the textbook, for example, we had over 1,200 references, and the textbook now I think has been out for three years. And again, a lot of it has to do with the production and release of nitric oxide, and the production and release of reactive oxygen species. And again, all those things that happen with that, you know, cytokine cascade and inflammatory mediators that are released with certain wavelengths of light. Bottom line is we're resulting in an accelerated tissue healing. Again, another biochemical cascade of events. You get that, you know, increased macrophage activity and leukocyte activity that comes in there, leukocytosis, and you get vascular regeneration, fibroblast production, early cell regeneration, and all those things that reduce our healing time. In fact, you know, it's estimated that across the board, there is at least, at least a 45 to 50% reduction in the healing time of most traumatic events. Most uh, things, you know, for example, recovery from surgery, recovery takes half the time when you're introducing laser therapy into the process. Again, I quote this study a lot because this was a triple blind study. You don't see many of those. And again, this was one basically where they measured the epithelial by uh, migration over wounds in 22 volunteers, and there was 153% greater wound contraction day six in the laser group, which is pretty significant. So how do we measure our progress of the patient? We have gait analysis, we have uh, gonometry, which is basically measuring the flexion and extension of the joints. We can basically measure the progress of, of muscles by measuring their circumference, which you can see a little video here showing that. And again, Within an area within a zone treated every day for four days, images taken on day seven, we've got thermal imaging, infrared thermal imaging, which is a very accurate way of measuring your progress and gives you a roadmap to guide your treatment. And in this study, which I was one of the participants of, is uh, we basically took at a rehab center, we took 18 geriatric patients and we basically imaged them to find out where their inflammation was, their increased uh, vascularity, then we lasered them with a set dose of 20 joules per square centimeter, and then imaged them in 30 minutes, and then at 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, and it's an objective measurement. We could actually take the measurements there, and you can see these images right here. You're looking at the dorsal view of a geriatric dog, and you can see a zone that's around you know, basically from just behind the shoulders all the way almost to the tail there. And you can see those red areas there, those are all areas of inflammation. And then after those four treatments from day one, two, three, and four, and then not again imaged until day seven, you can see that we've taken a lot of that inflammation out of there. And it just didn't stay out of there for a short time. It stayed out of there for three days after that last treatment. And then we had some that, you know, that you knew that it didn't. It uh, basically on this image here, it shows that that inflammatory response increased in the area. Well, it increased because that dog had become more mobile. He was moving around a lot more, but when the first image was taken, the dog was hardly mobile. He couldn't hardly walk and get around very well. And now we've got, you know, again, circulation throughout the whole area. So the laser there, you know, did alleviate enough pain to allow the dog to become more mobile and again, showed that increase in circulation. So quickly, uh, a little bit of review here you know, deport the importance of laser therapy in rehabilitation and, and performance maintenance. Again, we reduce the pain, we shorten the inflammatory response, we accelerate tissue healing. It is scientific evidence-based. 
and there's quantitative ways of measuring your results. So let's go into the cases here because I have some very interesting cases here. The first one was given to me by Laurie Dunbar. She's a runs a huge rehab center up in Montreal, Canada. And this was Coda. He had a he's a six year old uh, female, and you can see by his picture there, he looks a lot older than six years old. But he had a lot of you know history here. We had TPLO surgery in the right stifle in 2007, CCL deficient left stifle in 2011, but they didn't do surgery on it. And he's presented June 1st, you know, around, uh, this is when he was just six years old here with a non-weight bearing left hind limb problem, pain left inguinal area and effusion in the left stifle. Now you can see on his radiographs here that we have some radiographic change going on here. So this is something the, you know, we're not going to change with rehabilitation, but we can accelerate the healing of these lesions or make this patient improve their quality of life by reducing their pain and trying to restore some of their function. You can see here that, you know, inside those joints, look at all the, the change and the degeneration that's going on in both stifles there. And then laterally, when you look at that, you can again see that we've got a lot of change going on there. They did an orthocentesis of the left stifle, and basically the culture was negative. But here the problem list was, is he had chronic active osteoarthritis of the left stifle, secondary to instability, acute flare-ups. He had an abnormal sacroiliac joint. He was positive iliopsoas test, internal rotation during extension of the left hind limb. Pain on direct palpation of the left inguinal area. So the plan was, is to administer laser therapy on the left stifle at 10 joules per square centimeter daily. Also on the iliopsoas at four joules per square centimeter off contact, massage, core strength exercises. And then when the dog was able to, they were gonna put him in the underwater treadmill so he could regain his mobility, regain his range of motion in his joints. Now the image, the picture on the side there shows you where you basically have to and the way to treat the iliopsoas muscle. The iliopsoas muscle is very important to approach it ventrally and you know basically again try to cover every part of the muscle belly to the or from the origin to the insertion of it so after three sessions the owner note mar you know notes marked improvement in mobility and less pain so after three therapy sessions that's what happened and then decreased stifle effusion but continuing iliopsoas and groin pain lameness score is now eight out of ten instead of almost ten out of ten which is what we started with so now they changed the plan to laser therapy three times weekly for two more weeks. So in other words, you know, six more treatments, continued massage, core strength exercises. And again, with the goal of putting the, the dog eventually into the underwater treadmill. And again, after six therapy sessions, the iliopsoas was not painful. The lamest score was half, five out of 10. And they did start the underwater treadmill initiated. And again, before and after the underwater treadmill uh, sessions, again, before and after, they administered eight joules per square centimeter and six joules per square centimeter on the iliopsoas. Again, now the plan was physical therapy and laser therapy three times a week for the next two weeks. So what happened when we got him, when Coda became pretty well, you know, comfortable, they settled down to underwater treadmill twice weekly. When she was lame, which was once or twice, once a month, very occasionally lame, then they would again administer laser therapy. So that case went from being, you know, non-weight bearing all the way to being weight bearing. And again, you know, again, proving the quality of life of this patient. This is a three-year-old intact male malinois, started to refuse jump and release work on bite, competes all over the world in France, which I thought was interesting here with my, my uh, with Mano Medical being the sponsor of this event here. Radiographs were normal, but he started bunny hopping gait in about four weeks. This is Dr. Deb Tureka. She actually has her doctorate in human physical therapy, but she specializes totally in uh, canine rehabilitation and uh, performance maintenance. So again, Exxon had a right iliopsoas injury. He was painful upon palpation. He was referred to Dr. Tureka. Decreased hip extension with internal rotation, pain at L3 to L7 on the right side, roached and increased thoracic extension. So the plan was, is to laser him three times a week in addition to core exercises and passive range of motion for the hip joints. And again, the dosages that were used, the iliopsoas muscle was 10 joules per square centimeters on contact at 12 watts. The thoracic and lumbar regions were, uh, again, both hips at 10 joules per square centimeters, again, on contact. Reevaluation at two weeks. Uh, they did. They were able then to add the underwater treadmill 
uh, at two sessions. And again, they did it before and 10 minutes post. In other words, they got the animal out, dried him off, and allowed him to uh, again, administer it again. They found, why do we do it before and after? And you do that for a lot of different stages of rehab. And that's one of the take home pearls of wisdom from this little webinar here is, is that we need to basically make sure that we we loosen those muscles up and increase that circulation. So when we, there's, it's almost like warming them up before they do the exercise. Week four, the physical therapy sessions are now twice a week. Um, we were able, to, she was able to increase the time in the underwater treadmill. And again, before exercise and again, at the end of the session, week six, return to bite work and lower jumps and completely recovered from this iliopsoas injury. At eight weeks, able to continue training at a high level and resume bite work, no pain or lameness whatsoever. Now they did continue with the underwater treadmill for conditioning once a week. And again, they did administer the laser before and after those underwater treadmill sessions. How about a geriatric with chronic hip dysplastic dysplasia with pain from that? And again, rehabilitation is either conservative or after surgical management. A lot of times we you know, choose to go the route of total hip replacement or some other orthopedic procedure. And again, just like I showed you at the beginning there, post-surgery is not much different than treating them, you know, you know, at, without doing surgery. And again, we want to decrease the pain. We want to improve the hips range of motion if possible and building and maintaining the muscle mass that's there. Because as you know, when they get painful in their hips, they start to, muscle starts to atrophy because they're just not using those muscles. Post-operatively, you want to decrease the pain and inflammation from the surgery. You want to improve the comfort and leg limb use and protection of the sur you know, protect the surgical site, make that heal as fast as possible. And if you're just doing it unilaterally, you want to make sure this is an important thing, is to laser both hips because he's bearing, if he's has surgery done on one hip, that means he's they're now bearing most of their body weight on the opposite leg. And we don't want those to degenerate because we've already worked on one. So again, once the patient has healed, we improve range of motion, promote muscle mass, and return to a higher quality of life. And again, this laser therapy provides more versatility than any other modality in treating these dogs. So again, presentation may consist of pain in the hip, limitations of extension, weakness, decreased functional activities, depressed, lower quality of life. They're always compensatory areas of pain, so treat the whole patient. That's what I'm talking about. You know, we've talked, I was just at the holistic meetings, uh, H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C meetings in the United States here, but I've always said all along, we got to treat our patients holistically, the whole patient. So if you do have hip dysplasia, you got to remember also, and again, this is a, another take-home pearl here, is to also treat the lumbar spine, the lumbar, the sacral area, the joint there, the upper thoracic spine, and offloading, if they're offloading under the forelimbs, make sure you take a look and palpate all along the shoulders and see where they're compensating for that pain that they have in their hip. So here's a 12-year-old uh, pit bull mix. Painful areas, left hip more than the right, but both are involved here. Left thoracic and lumbar musculature, left stifle, and the left shoulder. Offloading onto the forelimbs, lack of range of motion, lack of extension in the stifles and shoulders. He was eight out of 10 lame at a walk. Here's his images. They, again, they were recommended to do radiographic studies. They didn't want to do that because of the cost, but they did allow thermal imaging because that was an easy scan. And when they basically identified all the areas that would benefit from further evaluation, and it also served as a roadmap for laser therapy. You can see this dorsal view, you can see where these white areas and red areas, all those would have benefited from laser therapy and we can objectively monitor the progress. And when they saw these images then and saw how many areas that were affected on this patient here, and again, you saw the both hips, you saw distal limbs, you saw the front shoulders there, the client, because of seeing that, became compliant and allowed radiographs of the hips. And now you can see on those radiographs that there's quite a bit of change in those hip joints there. So the plan became you know, real clear then to do you know, again, a unique plan of rehabilitation for this. Physical therapy three times a week, reevaluation each week. Again, hips, lumbar sacral joint, lumbar and thoracic spine, and paravertebral musculature. A pretty high dosage because he's a fairly large dog, 12 to 15 joules per square centimeter at 12 watts. Stifles and shoulders, again, our target is not quite as deep as it is in some of those paravertebral musculature and along the joint areas in the lumbosacral joint. So the dose was a little less, 10 joules per square centimeter. And at the same time, doing core strength and passive range of motion exercise 
and massage. And I mean, here you can see Dr. Tureka actually administering laser therapy to that patient. Again, exercise examples were passive range of motion, and you can see some of the, the uh, uh, I've got some films here of other dogs performing similar exercises that was, were done on this, on this patient. Active range of motion, Cavaletti rails, lateral stepping, backwards walking, strengthening, and everything else. And then actually a lot of these patients that have this, this condition, they benefit from really slowing down the underwater treadmill, but taking their weight off the hind end and making them walk backwards here. And again, laser therapy before and after that exercise. Two weeks, significantly less pain. Four out of 10 lame, owner reports that he's now running in the backyard. Four weeks, he was able to go on a maintenance plan, laser therapy once per week for two weeks at home with a targeted pulse electromagnetic field loop. And again, if his quality of life is maintained, rechecked as necessary. Degenerative myopathy. This is a difficult one because clients do not understand it. I don't know sometimes whether we understand it, but it's difficult to diagnose and obtain and difficult you know, for the owner to accept. And they don't quite understand it, but it's a non-inflammatory axonal degeneration anatomically between T3 and S3. So again, common rehabilitation techniques, active and passive exercises, massage, aquatic therapy, underwater treadmill if possible. A lot of these patients can't get in the treadmill. Laser therapy then becomes one of the most prominent modalities to be administered to this. Shockwave therapy and again, infrared thermal imaging to monitor the progress of the cases. Cavalettis, weight bearing and weight shifting, walking on uneven surfaces, stair climbing, functional exercise. And the goal is to return to function no need you know for for these dogs to degenerate again prolonged and improved quality of life preserved quality of life and again we're gonna why does this work because laser therapy increases the cellular respiratory rate we saw the actions you know that i outlined briefly there at the beginning and you're going to increase the blood flow to the reason because what's happening with that with that lack of neurological innervation to that area is we're getting a vasoconstriction because we have irritation on the sympathetic nerve supply to those muscles and we wanna increase, they're, you know, they're not getting the blood supply that they need. So the laser therapy is key here to reestablishing that blood flow to the region and of course alleviate any pain. And it slows the degeneration within the muscles on a cellular level and on the nervous system. I mean, remember what, what cells have the most mitochondria? Nerve cells. So of course the laser is going to be optimum treating that. Protocol dosage 25 to 30 joules per square centimeter, 10 to 12 watts on contact, the thoracic and lumbar spinal regions, all secondary compensatory muscles and all involved joints. Most cases it involved the stifles, hips, and the shoulder areas, additional orthopedic problems. If the dog also, the patient also suffers from osteoarthritis, you have to also take that into consideration. And again, this is the infrared thermal image of the dorsal view of a case of DM before th laser therapy and then this is after and that's actually four hours after that administration we did take a lot of that inflammation out of there now the kaufman study basically had a longer survival time when they included uh you know physiotherapy with the laser therapy and a mean of 255 days compared to animals that did not receive physiotherapy that only were basically functional for another 55 days before they had to take into you know, basically make a, a severe decision on their part. Now, unpublished results, Dr. Deb has done over 100 by now. I just talked to her last week, actually. These were all cases that were referred to her by a neurologist or referral hospital. She has basically developed a, a, a treatment program and program using the laser as a key part of it. And of the 96 dogs all exceeded past 12 months of age, some dogs have continued longer. So remember, the mean before was 55 days. Now Dr. Deb using a dose here of 20 to 40 joules per square centimeter over that musculature and doing it just twice a week, she was able to improve the quality of life enough that a lot of those dogs have made it over a year instead of just a couple of months. So I think that's outstanding. Porter here is, this was a a working dog for the police department and he was tracking a missing person and his nose was to the ground and he was all about business and he ran right off the end of a cliff that was about 14 and a half meters tall he did locate the missing person while injured he still even though he injured himself fairly badly he did go on because the person actually had fallen off that cliff he followed him right down their path and then found the person and basically they were life flighted in and saved that person's life 
So diagnostic specialized cast, of course, uh, from for several months that he had to wear. Uh, and then again, once he was out of that cast, he initiated 36 hours after injury, right after the injury, we initiated laser therapy. Now, why didn't we do it earlier than that? Uh, why didn't we administer it right away? Because there was probably some hemorrhage going on there. We wanted to make sure that all that hemorrhage was quiet before we started it. So they initiated laser therapy 36 hours after that initial injury, administered twice a week to the entire shoulder and carpus at a dose of 10 to 15 joules per square centimeter. And what I showed you there, and I'm sorry I, I skipped over that too fast, what I showed you there is when he was in the underwater treadmill, in order to keep him occupied and not trying to get out of the treadmill, even though he's recovering from an injury, they put some floating balls in there, which I thought was a brilliant idea. And it kept him really busy in there. Now, the treadmill's going while he's chasing these balls. So you can imagine what all his legs are doing right now. So again, by March, he resumed tracking and training. Just to give you an idea here, this is a dog that ran off a cliff and hyperextended his front leg. That was the original injury, plus a lot of trauma to some of his shoulder areas and stuff. And again, just to show you some of his training, this did not take long for him to fully recover. And you can see Porter actually, to cover his costs of all his therapy and all his surgery and his casts and everything else, he actually went on public appearance and became a poster child for working dogs for the police department. Again, Maintaining athletic performance, again, plays an integral part in pain in this because this is used, Dr. Tareki uses this and she does the Westminster Kennel Club shows. She does a lot of the world events. And she this is her basically go-to modality that she uses 95% of the time. I did the same thing with the horses at the racetrack. I would use this to maintain their performance, take away the inflammation and pain so that they would recover faster from a race and be able to, again, compete again quickly. So prevention of injuries, I mean, laser therapy, there's a lot of studies out there and starting back in 2012, 2015, 2009, 2009, again, that it actually helps prevent injuries, not just treats the injuries, but help prevent. Why? Again, we're increasing that blood supply to the area. We're basically causing a warm up without having any stress at all to the tissues. So again, higher level of available energy when compared to other modalities, accelerate the gains in conditioning and strength, faster recovery from athletic performance. Mechanism of action is the skeletal muscles are rich in mitochondria, so you're stimulating all those. There's, so there's an increase in metabolic rate. Facilitates, uh, again, muscle repair and uh, uh, decrease in muscle fatigue and a reduction in oxidative stress. Methodology, let's, when you treat these for performance maintenance, you must understand what your patient's job is. What is their event? Because all these different events, all these different jobs they have, no different than the equine. The difference between a trotter and a pacer and a thoroughbred and a reining horse, there are drastic changes. So we have to know what areas are stressed on our patients. Determine if there's pre-existing undiagnosed condition, are they pain-free? Do a gain analysis, do some thermal imaging on them, do any of the other diagnostics you knew. But then when you do, you're going to develop an individualized performance maintenance program. Again, we're, our goal is to minimize pain, maximize range of motion, strength, and function. Endurance events longer than 20 minutes in length, like sled dog racing, hunting, and field trials. The goal is prevention of fatigue and injuries. They found that, you know, again, I did this with some endurance horses that if we laser them before the event, the day before and the day of the event, they basically were able to compete at a higher level when compared to times that they, when they didn't have that done to them. And again, it's effective in preventing the development of skeletal muscle fatigue and enhanced recovery. And that's been proven in the literature. Actually, Farisi's study there is one that's worth reading if you're wanting, trying to do this. Uh, again, short aerobic events like agility, fly ball, short races and everything directly to the specific muscles prior to the activity, you're going to increase the available production of ATP. And then so before exercise, 30 to 60 minutes before, so at the show, 10, 2 to 10 joules per square centimeter on contact. And again, you have to know your events, but treat those muscles that are most active, perform some massage and stretching at the same time. So again, a 22 kilogram border collie involved in agility, shoulder adductors would receive five joules per square centimeters, time limit adductors will receive about eight joules per square centimeter, paxial and hip musculatures, eight, six to eight joules per square centimeters and any other painful area you find. Then after exercise, you want to assist in the rapid reduction of pain and inflammation associated with their performance. So again, we're gonna 
laser all those areas that repeat that receive repetitive stress during the event and apply all those areas exhibiting any tenderness of pain. So before and after. Let's talk about you know an equine injury here. This is a core lesion that I found on an eight-year-old jumper that it came up acute, right forelimb lameness due to competition over a poor surface. And there you can see the, the uh, ultrasonography that I performed on March the 10th. So the first treatment was, we didn't laser him right away because we wanted to make sure there was no hemorrhage there. So ice four times a day for three days, compression support wraps. 48 hours, we're still icing and wrapping, and that, but that's when we started laser therapy. 12 joules per square centimeter, 10 watts off contact, because the area was pretty tender. We couldn't have treated him on contact. Passive range of motion during administration, massage of the distal limb and the body. 96 hours, we stopped the ice and started controlled hand walking in addition to the laser therapy. What I call phase four was day seven. We had massage, passive range of motion. Now we were applying warm, moist heat to the area, laser therapy on contact every other day, support wraps, hand walking over ground poles, ice and wrap after the exercise. And these are the ground poles on the image there and kind of shows you the stretch and climb through arrangement of poles that I used. Again, laser therapy every other day on contact, support wraps and hand walking over cavalettis with increased height. So in other words, those poles were laying on the ground. The next step would have been to take them about oh, 12, 15 centimeters off the ground and make him walk over those. Again, phase four, laser therapy on, oh, six, I mean six, I'm sorry, laser therapy on contact every other day, support rider at walk over cavities of increasing height, ice and wrap after exercise. So phase seven, day at day 45, we rechecked the ultrasounds and look what we found. April 25th, so March 10th, to April 25th, this thing completely healed with no evidence of scar tissue, which is amazing. And that horse returned to exercise and uh, returned to competition in June 26th and placed sixth. So that's a huge, huge improvement there. Those were usually a career ending, if not a, you know, a season ending, if not a career ending injury. And we taken that completely healed it by using that rehabilitation protocol that was specific for that injury and returned that horse to comp to its previous level. Regenerative medicine with laser therapy and stem cell PRP. Again, what we want to do is you want to before you harvest the stem cells, you wanna laser that area, why? Because you're gonna increase the circulation and the literature states that we're gonna get four or five times more stem cells out of the extraction when we do that before we basically harvest those stem cells. Inject both intraarticularly and systemically your stem cells and then post-administration, again, of the laser therapy. For a long time, it was a myth that you could not laser over a joint that has just been injected with stem cells. But if you wait a day, or two days, and I haven't seen any difference between waiting two days versus one day, you get an immediate, I, I have no data to back this up, but clinically I saw an immediate you know, change, immediate response, a better response to it than if I just did the injection without any laser therapy included. Again, this is in the literature, again, from back in 2015. And again, canine bone marrow stem cells, six to 12 joules per square centimeter, 50 milliwatts power output, increased viability in the number of cells. Uh, that was by before collection. Again, uh, umbilical cord mesenchyma stem cells, again, a higher harvest, and again, the you know different wavelengths were used here and everything. Enhancement of a systemic wound healing by grafting of a human adipose-derived stem cells treated with low-level you know, light therapy. And basically, you know, low-level light therapy, low-level just means laser therapy. There's, you know, high-level is surgical, so everything's low-level. And again, this was actually exposing those stem cells to laser wavelengths. And of course, they felt that that helped uh, improve the implanted stem cells viability. Again, another study here. And again, added to implanted greater bone formation and healing. I mean, these, these, were, these literature goes on and on and on. Like I said, in the textbook, this was three years ago, it was published and we had over 1,200 references in the textbook. So here, let's do a case here. This is a 13-year-old female spade Labrador retriever bait head kid carried upstairs by the owner. Couldn't go up the steps. Degenerative joint disorder on both hips. Again, treatment protocol was laser therapy, uh, five joules per square centimeter pre-collection of the stem cells, eight joules per square centimeters uh, on the hips, musculature, passive range of motion every other day for three treatments and twice a week. And this dog improved in three weeks. Owner watched her climbing the stairs on her own and very comfortable in three weeks time. 
Maintenance then was photobiomodulation therapy, laser therapy sessions twice per month or as needed. So summary here, laser therapy is the, an integral part of any rehabilitation program, no matter what the injury is, no matter what the problem is. It's scientific evidence-based and it's extremely efficacious. It is your main foundation of rehabilitation. And it's no longer does laser therapy work, it is, should be, is am I using it in all the cases that would benefit from it? So I know I've hit the high points here and I'm under my time limit here. So we might have some time for some questions, Ramey, if we have a, a chance or if anybody sent anything in. But I, again, I do have my email up address up here and I also have Mano Medical's email address. If you want more information about their laser system, therapy system, or if you have a direct question, they will make sure it gets to me if you misplaced my email address. But any questions you have, we can take some now. And then, of course, you can email. And I just, again, want to thank all of you for attending. I enjoy thoroughly, you know, sharing my knowledge with everybody. Thank you very much, Ron. Can you hear me? I do. I hear you fine. All right. I have I have a few questions. And we have uh, probably 10 or 15 minutes. You you did great today. You you were shorter than the previous time. So that's maybe... good editing. That's what that is. That's you know I'm still I'm still talk too much, but it was good editing. I edited I edited two cases out about an hour ago before I gave this because I knew I'd run over uh -huh. if I did. <laughs> As always, it was really, really interesting. And I can tell uh, by the numbers of uh, questions that I got. So I'm saying that again for those of you that didn't ask any questions. Still, you have a chat box, so you can write it down, and I'm going to read them. And uh, Dr. Regal will uh, try to, to answer them. One of the first questions that I have is, um, uh, can we use a laser with the iron plates, you know, if there are some iron in the body? Oh, yes. Absolutely. There, you know, there's no, they does not heat those up. It does not do any damage to them or anything. Absolutely. That is actually one of the, the myths that has been dispelled over the years. But for a long time, everybody was afraid of that because we didn't know. Now we know. So, yes, it is safe to do that. Okay. All right. Uh, when considering laser therapy for a practice that includes feline and other species, are there key features key features to consider for all versus just canine patients? No, I mean you're going to take your dosages down for a feline. For example, let's take a geriatric feline that we want to improve the quality of life on. You know, we're going to use a dosage of five joules per square centimeter, for example, over the arthritic areas. And again, you're going to have to treat the whole patient. So the protocols here are basically we're based on canine, but to adapt them to this feline, all you're going to really do is lower the dosage because our target tissue isn't as deep. Our target tissue isn't as hard to reach. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, what are the top objections from patients when laser therapy is prescribed for patients and how do you best address those in a way they can easily understand? That is a very good question. And when I first started this, of course, there was big pushback from your clients because number one, the biggest objection was is they don't believe it. They don't believe it works. We're shining a light. We're shining wavelengths of light on their on their dermis on their skin and we're causing a physiological change we're causing a clinical result so the biggest objection is come on i'm paying for this and this is going to work so you have to prove it to them and honestly one of the best ways that i proved it was apply if they allow it apply it to the client so in other words if the client has any pain and you know most of the older clients that would come in, would have, you know, arthritis in their hands or something that's easily accessible, a shoulder. And I would show them, okay, I'm going to laser you first if you allow me to, and you're going to feel a difference. And if you don't get a wow factor, then we won't bother to use it on your pet. But I got a wow factor 95% of the time. And it, again, was a technique that I used a lot. The other way is to show them infrared thermography. If you have that in your practice, you can take a before and after image. And right away, if you take one before and you show them all those areas of inflammation and then you laser them, what you're going to see immediately afterwards is a huge increase in circulation because you're causing that nitric oxide release. You're causing all those things that increase circulation and the client is going to have a wow factor just seeing that image. 
but again, it's I got around that most of the time by treating the the owner, the client, or the trainer. The other thing that I did now that comes to mind is is I would say, okay, let's uh, watch him walk, and I'm going to show you what I'm observing, and you you can agree or disagree, and we'll work together here to come up with how the dog's moving or how the patient's moving around. For example, if I've got a dog, I would take him outside, or I would put him in. I had a fairly large clinic, I would walk him up and down the hallway, and then I would laser him and do it again right away. And, you know, again, you've got a wow factor because you get that immediate relief of pain. The patient is going to move better. And then you can show the client, look, it helped now. Now, how long is it going to last? I don't know. Sometimes it lasts a few hours, sometimes it lasts a few days, but it's cumulative in effect. So we have to follow the treatment protocols here to have a successful clinical response. Yeah, Three ways. I have to say that uh, I've been, I've done a lot of uh, uh, demos and we were using it on the animal, but also on the on the pets uh, on the vet or on the owner. So right. that's a that's Thank a good uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with so many laser options, how do you know which laser is best best for your needs or your practice needs? Okay. Well, we actually did a whole lecture on that. So if you want to go through the archives and find that that lecture, that will do a lot better, give you a lot better answer than what I'm about to give you here. Because again, you're absolutely right. There are quite a few lasers on the market right now, and you know, all of them have their their advantages, and some of them have some disadvantages to them. But what you want to do is a couple of things that you want to make sure of is number one that you have enough power in the laser because otherwise the dosages that are efficacious the dosages that you need to penetrate to the target tissue take a long long time to administer if you have a, a laser that has you know 10 12 15 watts of power 20 watts of power somewhere in there you're going to be able to administer those dosages in a reasonable amount of time where you can charge reasonably for them and not take up a whole bunch of time doing it. You can always turn a higher powered laser down. You can't turn a lower powered laser up. So if you're going to do rehab, you're going to be using this laser many times during the day uh, for all your rehab cases. So when you have a caseload like that, again, time becomes a, a very important factor here because if I have, you know, just say, let's just say I have five patients and it takes me an extra 10 or 15 minutes to do each one because I've got a lower powered laser, where do I find that extra hour? Where do I find that extra hour and a half during the day? You know, that's more labor cost, everything else. Rehab is labor intensive, so as it is, we wanna keep that labor cost at a, at a minimum. So, and again, uh, the other thing, you know, there's a couple of other things that I point out in the other lecture, but another thing is you wanna buy it from a, per, a manufacturer. I mean, somebody who makes the laser, not necessarily just a distributor but somebody that makes that laser and you know is going to be there if you need help or service because I bought several pieces of equipment not lasers in my practice but other pieces of equipment that were sold to me and when they were basically when I had a problem with them or I broke them in the case of my fluoroscope I couldn't get it repaired and that is very disappointing. So buy it from somebody like Mano Medical that is very reputable and has a you know foundation of a company since 1945. I mean, that's a long time to be in business and they wouldn't be in business if they didn't offer good service. And, and as I told you before, don't forget that uh, all the previous webinars and this one will be are available on our YouTube channel, the Mano Medical YouTube channel. If, if you don't find it, write to us and we'll give you the links, okay? Uh, I think we're going in Slovenia now. Uh, is it better to use higher dosage than lower? Well, your dosage is dependent on how deep your target tissue is, basically. So when you're saying a higher dosage, in other words, do I, you're talking, I think, about power rather than dosage. Do I turn the laser up to 10, let's say I have a 10 watt laser. Do I leave it on 10 watts all the time? No, not necessarily. If I've got a superficial target, like a joint, for example, a stifle joint, you don't need to have it at 10 watts of power. You know, it's just like I always say, if I use a garden hose to pour squirt water on the ground with a pressure nozzle on it, it's going to blast all over the place and a lot of it's going to re reflect it off. If I use a sprinkling can, it's going to be better. So you turn the power down. The other thing is you administer it on contact. When you administer any laser off contact, you lose about 60% of the energy that basically is reflected off the skin and does not penetrate down to the tissue. So 
don't confuse power with dosage. The dosage is going to be the same. The power determines how fast you can administer that dosage. Do I treat them all real fast? No, because you want to have the client have, you know, see the perceived value in it. I mean, you can't, you know, basically, you know, sure, you can turn the laser up and treat a, a one little small area in a few minutes, but then the, you know, then when you hand the client the bill, they look at you like you got four heads because you just charged them for something that didn't really take you very long. And you want to do a good job of it. You want to basically make sure that, put them through passive range of motion while you're treating them. And again, it's dependent on the, on the depth. Uh, so I would turn, as you saw, some of the, my, my powers were up because the targets on those were deep in the muscle. Uh, the powers were down. If I'm treating a dermatitis, for example, or something, I'm using a very low power because my target tissue is right at the end of the handpiece. So I'm treating a urinary problem, for example, I'm using a higher power because look where my target is. And again, positioning of the patient, the technique of administration, those are all important. But I, I understand your question there. And I'm not trying to get around it. I'm just giving you the different aspects to look at it. Okay. Would you would you use laser therapy on a lesion at the origin of the suspensory ligament in a horse? Does it work at this depth or just more superficial structures? Oh no. You want to try to when you're when you're lasering those tendinous structures and ligament structures in the horse. Think of it like you're treating a uh, very thick piece of cable because you're trying to stimulate the, you know, again, you're trying to get that light to every single cell of your target tissue and you want to stimulate the circulation to that area. So I'm going to go on the suspensory. I'm not going to just go, you know, let's say we have a lesion and we have a strain. I want to go almost, you know, at least, you know, up the limb pretty far and go all the way down. If I can't, I mean, for example, on the suspensory, I'd probably go from almost to the origin of that to the insertion. I mean, I wouldn't go all the way down to the insertion on it if I, my lesion is above the, you know, above the fetlock, but I would if it's like right near the fetlock and both branches of the sensory. You want to make sure you get all good margins of it because, again, excuse me, I'm going to adjust that treatment to my clinical response. And if you should see a you know, I always said better in four or treat them no more. So if I'm not seeing a reduction in the swelling, a reduction in the pain on palpation, those kind of things, I'm either increasing the dose or I'm administering it to more areas. And, you know, you have to be flexible on these things. But that's a, it's a very good question. Don't just treat the lesion. Treat all the surrounding tissue and all the blood vasculature that's serving that anatomical area. Okay, um, I have two more questions. We have uh, around three minutes, so I think uh, we can uh, continue with those two questions. Uh, okay. we, uh, I'm, I'm going to stay with the horse. Is it indicated to decrease the active phase and growth of an exostosis? I don't know if I pronounce this, pronounce this well. Ex exostosis. Exostosis? E yeah. Okay, all right. So again, the first part of the question, you broke up a little bit. Is it indicated to decrease the active phase, phase and growth of an exostosis? Yes, you're not going to you're not going to decrease the size of it, but you're going to you know break that in that vicious inflammatory that's response that's causing it. So if I find a, you know a small spur or something going on there. We don't want it to get any worse and we know it's aggravating the joint tissue or the tendon that's over you know lying over the top of it or whatever so what we're going to do is take the inflammation out of there because that's being formed in the response to an inflammatory process uh basically a strain maybe it's from even from conformation to that area you know maybe the, the horse normally puts strain on the medial side of his limb rather than you know centering it over his limb maybe it's his you know, the farrier work there. So it's going to slow it down, but it's not going to, you know, of course, your clients want you to take it off. You want you want the laser to, to remove it. Well, that's a different laser. This is going to slow it down and help maintain that athletic performance of that. That's a very good question. Okay. I mean, we, sh we should call you Dr. Regalpedia or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, this it's, it's because I've been at it so long, that's all. <laughs> you have the answers to every question, every webinar, you know, I'm amazed. And well, even... I've, I've, they don't call it practice for nothing, 
I made a lot of mistakes early, so I'm trying to help my colleagues here keep from doing that three years of figuring it out. I'm trying to let them figure it out in three minutes instead. <laughs> and, and I'm sure they're all joining me, you know, to thank you for all that. Um, so what is on contact versus off contact and how do you determine when off contact is necessary? Well, these are really good questions. Dave. This is a good group. <laughs> okay. On contact, of course, increases the amount of photonic energy that you're going to be able to penetrate to the tissue. So on contact means my, my hand piece is directly on the top of my, the, the skin. And that is good. Now, what determines the difference of when you can do that and when you can't? You should always do that unless the patient, it's uncomfortable for the patient. So in other words, if uh, I would go on contact, uh, I'll take a horse's stifle because that's right in the area where you're going to really get kicked if it really hurts them. And most of them have had their joints injected already. So they're a little gun shy. So when they feel that change or that stimulation that to come from the laser, Sometimes you can't treat them on contact right away, but I would love to be able to. So sometimes I treat them off contact first, and then maybe even after 10 minutes or five minutes of treatment, they'll be comfortable enough that you can do it on contact. So the rule is always on contact unless it's too painful for the patient to tolerate the treatment. How's that? That's a little, that, that's more, that's more than my usual, uh, long answer, isn't it? <laughs> so. All right. And well, because we're enjoying that so much, I have another question. I have two more questions, but let's do one, the last one, and we'll answer to the other one maybe uh, some other day. Uh, write your questions to us also, but we'll find the answers for you of the questions that are already asked. Let's do one more. Some patients have a lot of hair. How do you adjust the parameters with hair? Oh, hair. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, again, our, my internet connection broke up a little bit. I wasn't sure what you said there, but here. So, again, you try to get your administration on contact down at the skin. So, how do you do that when a patient, let's just take a uh, uh, a long-haired dog, a real long-haired dog. That German Shepherd was a long-haired dog that I used as an example. Uh, some of the snow dogs, the Malamutes, the, you know, the Eskimo dogs, as we call them in this country is you wanna to try to go and work your handpiece right down to the skin. If you're treating them off contact, the hair is gonna absorb most of your therapy. So if you do have to treat them off contact because it's uncomfortable, you want to number one, lower the power because again, you're going to have a lot of energy lost in the hair and administer it slowly, but off contact, you wanna make, you wanna up the dosage. So lower the power and up the dosage when they have long hair. But most of the time you can get a technique where you go against the grain of the hair. Like I would take a brush, and I'm sorry that I have to use my hands here, but I would brush the hair against the grain and have my hand piece right at the, behind it. So therefore I'm basically have my hand piece, whatever it is, you know, if it's a, a just a, uh, the head of the hand piece right on the skin, and I'm right down to the skin level. There's a few hairs between the, the end of the fiber and the skin, but not many because I've worked it down underneath. But then again, you're gonna have some patients that are so painful they can't take that. So you basically laser them you know, off contact, but do it you know, nice and gently until they can tolerate on contact. And that's how I got around hair. Of course, shaving it helps a lot but a lot of clients really don't like it when you shave their patient. Now, if it's a, it's a recovering from a surgery, they're already shaved, so that helps. But shaving it will help reduce that and makes it, you know, a lot more effort, you know, a lot more, a lot easier to do. And a lot, uh, you get a lot more penetration that way, but a lot of, especially when you're doing performance maintenance, you can't go shaving the dogs that are gonna be entered into an agility trial, for example that Border Collie that I had on there, you wouldn't shave him and then put him in an agility trial on Saturday. That would be, uh, you know, everybody would say, well, what's wrong with your dog? You know, what's going on there? It's kind of a dead giveaway that there's a problem going on there. So there's ways of working around the hair technique wise. And uh, honestly, you can email me if you have a specific breed in mind that you wanna find that information for. But I, you know, basically figure out whatever breed it is or however long the hair is, I figure out a way to get under it. <laughs> That's the that's the the short answer. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Ron. Again, 
Thank you so much. Thank, uh, thank you, all of you from all around the world to attend this webinar. Uh, probably by the end of next week, we will get back to you uh, and send you the link for access to replay. Uh, you have on the screen now our email addresses. So if you have any question, if you want to know who is the distributor in your country, if you have questions regarding education, we'll be there for you. Thank you again, everyone. Maybe see you next year for another webinar. But for 2022, that was the last one. And it was such a pleasure uh, to have uh, all that education. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Regal. Thank you, Ron. Nope. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And, uh, you know, provide the best care you can to your patients. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Bye-bye.